Finding Hope. And I like the lyrics to that song. It kind of, it's a song that tells the gospel story. And if I remember, I'll put that so that uh, link for you to watch on YouTube in here later after the Bible study. But tonight we're going to watch. Is that why everybody's upset? <laughs> we're going to watch Refiner's Fire. I, I haven't heard that. Not at all. So we'll watch this and then type done. Hi, violinist. I don't, I don't think that's true. But God knows, and he'll take care of his people one way or another. Do 
That's actually a beautiful song and a prayer, too. So, Father, we bless you in this night. Lord, we thank you that you have called us. You've called us to you. You called us your children. You called us in love. And you call us to be set aside, to be holy unto you. Father, sometimes that refiner's fire is not a pleasant place to be. And yet it's necessary. And Lord, we trust you. Or we ask you, when we can't trust you, to help us to trust you in the process of sanctification. And Father, as you know, there's a hurricane coming uh, towards the United States, coming towards Cuba right now and towards it's in the I think Dominican Republic or somewhere and then it's coming up the the west coast and projected to go either across the panhandle or across the northeastern area of Florida and then up into Georgia and, and those states and father I pray that there would be no hysteria but that people would be mindful of the forecasters that will let us know what we need to do and when we need to do it so, Father, we, I ask for safety, protection. I ask that there be no fear, but that there be uh, an abundance of wisdom. And, Lord, for those people that just had that storm up on the eastern seaboard, of the, especially the eastern, yeah, the eastern part of Canada, and, Lord, I know what an awful mess that is after a storm like that comes by. The cleanup is just horrendous. So I ask you to give them endurance and give them rest and send people to help those who need help with the cleanup and send those who need help for preparation in Florida, send helpers to help them. Father, I thank you for that Billy Graham rapid response team that goes so often to the places all around the world where disasters, natural disasters have occurred and they bring the good news and they also bring food and water and, and physical labor. So, Father, I thank you for your people, not just them, but all over the world that go when they see a need and step into the need and bless you by blessing others. Father, may many hearts and lives be turned to you. And, Father, I especially want to lift up those of us who have who are not feeling well ourselves, who have children or other family members or friends who are not feeling well and need physical healing, those who need emotional healing, and Lord, um, those who need the ultimate healing, which is found in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. We have been, and we will be for a while, talking about my favorite subject, uh, the ABCs of the Father Heart of God. And I, each week I'm going to review them, and the reason is because I'm hoping they will sink in to me better and into y'all too. Uh, we'll review by reading just the couplet each week and the verse for it, the, not the verse, the reference. Once our heart and our mind really wrap around the truth in these, these tidbits from the word, and we know that we know the truth about who God is, it becomes so much easier to trust him when things are difficult and to go to him when we have done wrong and need forgiveness and change. Refiner's Fire so in the A category, Jesus is our advocate. That's in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. And therefore I know, we can know that God is for us, Romans eight thirty one. He is all-knowing in John sixteen thirty and John 21, 17. And therefore we can live peacefully and securely and undisturbed by the stuff going on around us, Isaiah 32, 18. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega from Revelations 1, 8. And we are being completed in Christ Jesus. 
There's a lot of A attributes, and they're all so rich. He's the Ancient of Days. Before I was, I am, he says. Daniel, that's not in Daniel, but it says that elsewhere. Daniel 7, 9. I am not my own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Jesus is the anointed one, Psalm 2, 2. But we are anointed, 1 John 2, 27. God has all authority. Jesus has all authority, Matthew 28, 18. And we have been given delegated authority to overcome, Luke 10, 19. The last A one that we did is God is our avenger. You know, we don't have to pay people back for the things they do to us. Because God is our avenger when we let him. Psalm 18, 47. And we manifest God's purposes to rulers and authorities. Ephesians 3, 10 through 12. Then we did the A, B, C's. We did B. Our Father, our Abba, blesses us. He blesses with every heavenly gift. And therefore, we have all we need. And I've lost the verses somewhere in my notes. Jesus is the beloved Son of God, and we are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6 and Matthew 3, 17. He blesses, Psalm 67, 7, and therefore we are blessed, Psalm 2, 12. Jesus is the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us from sin, 1 John 1, 7b, and therefore we are clean, John 15, 3. Jesus is the bread of life, John 6, 35, and therefore we are filled with good things. And the last three in the A, B, C, Bs. <laughs> Jesus is the bright morning star in Revelation, and therefore we are rescued. We are rescued from the dominion of darkness, Colossians 1.13. Jesus is our brother. Hard to believe, but he is. John 20.17. And we are the brother or sister of our Lord Jesus, Hebrews 2.11. Ah, he is the burden bearer. We spent a lot of time on that last week. Matthew 11.30. And therefore, we are lifted out of the depths. And we also spent time on the C one. He is our comforter. Do you need comfort? God is your comforter. Isaiah 51, 12. And we are encouraged because he is. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Um, we stayed on the comfort of God and from God and, and how we share that comfort with others last week. Tonight, our first couplet is, and I love this. God is compassionate. Psalm 145, 8. And we have received the riches of his grace because of his great compassion. The compassion of God is a vast, vast, vast topic. It's a wonderful study. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. Okay, so we're going to look at he is compassionate first. And this is interesting. We're not going to dwell on it, but it's so many places where they repeat it word for word. He is compassionate. It says in Psalm 145, 8, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And that exact phrase, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in love, or in steadfast love, is written in four different places. Psalm 103.8, Psalm 145.8, Joel 2.13, and Jonah 4.2. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Isn't that good to remember? And therefore, grace upon grace. Have you ever heard that phrase? Therefore, we have received the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7 through 8 says, 
in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Let's look at that whole little passage, verses 3 through 14 of Ephesians. Because context is, text is so very rich. It starts out in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace by which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purposes, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. And in him... Isn't this a wonderful, heart-filling promise or reminder? In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also... When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And I saw some people earlier in the room talking about that very thing. They were talking about... um the, not predestination, they weren't using that. Oh, they were talking about the counsel of his will and how sometimes, I think I think Papa was one of them, uh, sometimes it doesn't seem like a good thing at the time, but it really is always going to be a good thing because it's God's thing that he's doing in us and for us and through us. And so when we read that passage, Do you find that passage both amazing and comforting and confronting? I do. And so we're going to look at a little bit of it in bit by bit. It's all of those things. It's amazing, it's comforting, but it's also confrontational. Because we don't have any excuse, do we? <laughs> but Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are blessed, all of us are blessed already with every spiritual blessing. And therefore, we bless God and we thank him. And in verse 4 and 5, it said, even as we as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world wow that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will and you know what that says in english we are chosen in him we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And why? Besides the fact that he loves us and wanted us, 
He did it so that we could be holy and blameless before him because he predestined us for adoption as his very own children. And we've talked about that in the past few weeks. You go like, yes, for his God pleasure, his good pleasure, and his God pleasure. And it's hard to live up to. If we can even begin to wrap ourselves around the security of that, think about that. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world, predestined to be his children, adopted, a permanent, sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. All of those things are mentioned in that passage. And if we could even begin to wrap ourselves around the security of that, wouldn't we be slower to anger? and way more hopeful and trusting. And if we really believed our adoption as sons and daughters was secure, would we behave differently? If we didn't need the approval of men, it, we might not get so upset when somebody does something we don't like, or when things don't go the way we want, or when a hurricane's coming, or not. And verse 6 says, To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You know who the beloved is, right? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. And do you see it? His own glorious grace is what he has blessed us with in and also as the beloved. Jesus is the beloved, but we are his beloved children, his beloved ones. And in verse 7, we are reminded that we have, we have redemption through his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. We have been redeemed. Mine too. I love it. <laughs> it's such a hopeful book. Verse 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Did you erase that? You didn't need to erase that. And so what that is saying is making known, oh, okay, making known to us by way of the Bible, the mystery of his will and his purpose, which is and was and forever shall be the plan for the fullness of time to be united with and in him. Next, verse 11, in him, in Christ, in Jesus, we have obtained an inheritance, because, you know, children inherit from their parents, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. And notice... We have obtained as our inheritance to be in his will, to rest in the counsel of his will or his glory. It's kind of a fancy way of saying to do what he says, <laughs> to believe what he says, to do what he says, to live like he says, and to live in the hope of our eternal glory. We were, in a sense, Created by God for his glory. And you know what? That includes all who choose to receive him. Including, it includes us with any defects or handicaps we have. I don't see any exclusions to say, well, that one's a, a Down syndrome trial. Or look, that child was born without feet. 
Can you think of some famous people like that? That person was born blind. Well, so, God has a good plan and a good purpose for them. That one only lived a week. That one only lived in the womb. God loves them. God predestined. God has a plan, and they're eternally saved, too. Even, even the little child who was born with or suffered some brain damage at birth is included as one who will and can bring glory to God. Look at Johnny Erickson Tata's life. If you think whatever your handicap is, it excludes you. Hey, Savon, look at that guy. What is that guy's name that has no feet? And he ended up getting married and has children, and he goes around preaching everywhere. I can't think of his name. It skips my head. And in order for that to happen, I think violinists might know his name. The only criteria, oh, that's very cool. A treasure that used to come here has been to her camp and met her too. Maybe you met treasure and didn't know it. <laughs> the only criteria for, to, for this all to be true is to set our hope in Messiah. Our hope is not necessarily in getting well, and our hope is not in life being easier, but our hope is in the knowledge that we matter. You matter. Every single one of the people in here and the people that aren't in here too matter. Our lives matter. We were created for his good pleasure and purpose and nothing will change that. We are enough when we are in Christ doing his will and living life from a secure position of his dearly beloved. There you go, Psalmist Nick. However you pronounce his last name. He's amazing. And we're not finished with that passage yet. Now verse 13 and 14. <laughs> In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Look at that. When we heard and received, this sort of heard means receive the truth, a.k.a. also known as Jesus. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our security in Jesus. That is just like, wow. And it's so funny. That when I start to work on these studies, I only know the couplets. And then when I begin to look into the scripture, it's like God just takes me on this little discovery adventure, which I can come and share with all of you. I love it. And I'm very grateful to Abba, even when, like this time, we're going through them again, some of us. For me, they are like fresh manna for my heart. And I hope they are for you, for each of you. What's that say? The word is living and active, a two-edged sword that pierces through the bone and marrow, and it pierces through the gunk <laughs> that gets on us from living life in this broken world, especially the gunk of the last few years. And it's fresh. His mercy is fresh and new every morning. Oops, I didn't copy it all. The next couplet that said, He is conquering... He is conquering Revelation 6, 2, and we are more than a conqueror because Romans 8, 37. This is what Revelation 8, 2 says, 6, 2 says. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Did you know that that's a very controversial passage? I did not, but I found out. 
And uh, this is at the end of time, and I'm going to read you. I, I picked just one commentary, but you really ought to go study that because there's very conflicting views on who that is talking about. But most of them agree that they're talking about the Lord, the Lord Jesus. This is at the end of time. Jesus is the writer, or most scholars think so, although others think differently. Clark's commentary says, verse Revelation 6 2, a white horse. And this is a, this one was the easiest to understand consensus I could find. It's supposed to represent the Antichrist. Can you believe that? I don't believe that for one minute. Go look it up. Just go look it up in multiple concordances, okay? But I believe that it's what Clark says. I would love for Coram Deo to tell us what he thinks. But let's read what Clark said. He's way smarter than me. Uh, a white horse supposed to represent the gospel system, pointing out its excellent swiftness and purity. He this, and, and also a white horse is what conquering kings rode. I know. He that sat on him is supposed to represent Jesus Christ. A bow, and this, the, a lot, several people said the bow was the preaching of the gospel darting conviction into the hearts of sinners. Because like when you pull the bow, the bow and the arrow back and you let go, it flies and his word flies forth and never returns void. Isn't that kind of neat? Yeah. Just a bow. A crown which is the emblem of the kingdom which Christ is to establish on earth, and conquering and to conquer, which is overcoming and confounding. I like that word, confounding the Jews first, <laughs> and then the Gentiles. Like, what? What? Spreading more and more the doctrine and the influence of the cross over the face of the earth. So that's what I believe it, it symbolizes. And because that's been done, I know, only Jesus. I am more than a conqueror, Romans 8, 37. And I love Romans 8, 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are not conquerors because we're so cool and all that. No, no, no. We're because conquerors because of Christ. And let's look at the context for that. In conquerors, in, in all these things, what things? This is what things. I know, but we're not going there tonight. As I said, 90%, 99% of them agree with Clark. And that's something you can um, go research yourself. <laughs> okay? Uh, let's look at the things. And these are the things. It says, Romans 8.37 says, No, in all, the, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So what things? Verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And who, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed is interceding for us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, that means uh, not having all you need, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Nope, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Love, verse 38 and 39, for I am sure, I am sure, some versions say I am convinced, for I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that honestly, it makes me cry. There's a whole lot in the scripture that we need to remind ourselves of, and that's what we mostly do on Monday night. Do you see it? Does your heart get it? Do you get it in your heart, in your mind, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit, in your emotions? God is for us. Then who can be against us? They can try, but it won't succeed in the end. Who can bring any charges against us? Again, they can try, but it is God himself who justifies us. And who can condemn us? No one, because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us right now. What or who? can separate us from the love of God. And you know the answer. Nothing. Nothing can. Not tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, which is physical needs, or danger or sword. And even if we die, or when we die, we are still conquerors, and we know our ending. Because it goes on to remind us, not life, or death, or angels, or rulers, nothing now or in the future, nothing at all can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So... We're stopping after this sentence. Yes, Hebrews 7.25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession. And this is the closing. So guys, when life is hard, when we don't feel good, when we are in need, when people are ever so mean to us, when that happens, and we remember who always loves us unconditionally. It just helps a lot, doesn't it? So, Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. It's so powerful. And your word is so comforting. And your love is so all-encompassing and everlasting. Father, you are the God of all comfort who desires to comfort us in every sort of need or affliction. Father, you ordained before the beginning of the world that we would become your sons and your daughters, not just sons and daughters, but dearly loved sons and daughters. Father, I thank you that each person here has a purpose that you have a plan for all of our lives, that our lives matter. We are not the same. We don't have the same abilities and talents or gifts, but we are all your children, and we are all beloved. So, Father, we thank you. Help us to remember what we know when our heart gets down. Like the psalmist said, Why so downtrodden, O my soul? Trust in the Lord. Hope in the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless each one here as we go through this week. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. And it's Psalmist's turn. You know, Psalmist, thank you, there it is. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. And you know what the violinist does? He ministers. God's love to us with his music. It just dawned on me. He ministers God's love to us.
we go. I got my volume turned all the way up as far as it goes. And got my hymns picked out as well as my hers.
Thank you, Psalmist. I mean, the violinist. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I was reading because Psalmist wrote, ooh. Um, and I just got a text that the repairman's coming at 8 a.m. Dear goodness. Y'all have a great week, and I'll see you tomorrow, most of you. Bye. True, it does. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you, violinist, for playing for us. You're welcome. Uh, I loved your selection. <laughs> and you're welcome. Thanks for coming, everyone.